thank you for being here today. I am Maria Chiara Gasparini, and I am Assistant Professor of Chinese Art and Architecture at the University of Oregon. A recent excavation in Qinghai province, China, have disclosed a textile and artwork from the Tuyuhun Tubo tombs, Tubo referring to early Tibetan period, that suggest artistic and cultural exchanges along an external branch of the main Silk Road between Gansu and Sichuan provinces across Qinghai, and from there toward Tibet and the Himalayas. In my previous work, I briefly discussed a group of silk textiles, possibly from Qinghai or Sichuan, that I analyzed in 2014 in the China National Silk Museum, Hinanzhou, Zhejiang. In light of the recent material excavated or that appeared on the art market, I have reevaluated some of the data previously collected, and today I will discuss the technical and iconographic features of one of the 8th, 9th century um, fragments held in Hangzhou that eventually I discovered to be the continuation of a large panel held in the Abbe Stiftung, Regisburg, Switzerland. This panel is particularly important because, as I argue, it's part of a group of textiles that combine Central Asian zoomorphic motifs, often identi identified as Sassanian or Sogdian, with the indigenous Qinghai Tibetan element. It was likely used to decorate the interior of a tent, possibly of the type that in Chinese sources is referred to as golden tent, used by Uyghur and Tibetans in the 8th, 9th centuries. It exemplifies that the processes of acculturation and identity through peripheral material culture and pictorial art. So today I will first discuss the weaving features of the fragment and the initial graphic reconstruction. Then I will talk about the comparison with the panel in the Abbe Stiftung and the possible loom used to weave such a large silk. I will analyze the overall iconography. And finally, I will discuss the function of the panel and its use in early Tibetan funerary context. Regarding the analysis and graphic reconstruction, the fragment in the China National Silk Museum appeared as a damaged thick rectangular thick web face compound 1-2S fill with the Z-twist warps and with eight web color throughout, which is the highest number documented to date. A web face textile is made with a main warp, a binding warp, and a weft composed of two or more series of thread that can be ended in tabi, also known as takete, or samite, also known um, or twill, also known as samite. The fragment measures 68 by 52 centimeters and has a, about a quarter of a randal at the top left corner and three smaller randal at the bottom right corner that are linked to each other with an earth-shaped petal. Each of these randall encloses um, an animal that is only partially visible. Above one of the three randalls, the fragment features a running half animal with hoofs on the right here. Below this tree, between the right and central randall, a triangular motif um, appear on a curved band enclosing crescent that suggests a giant central medallion. I reconstructed the missing portion and the overall design by measuring every graphic element and comparing this with other similar fragments in the same collection and in other institutions that I had previously analyzed. The rundles, which should all be the same size, however, have different diameters. This characteristic is typical of these textiles. In fact, another example in the same collection that clearly shows this feature and help the reconstruction of the piece under discussion is a rectangular wet face S wheel with two lob rundles, each enclosing a single duck facing right, with the Sassanian royal ribbon called Vativia, and a necklace with three medallion held in the back. Above these two, four other almost half rundles are visible, enclosing the feet and wings of different birds facing left. This fragment is almost identical to other discovered in Dulan, Qinghai. 
Like the previous standard fragment, both these two are one to web based uh, S grid compound with Z twisted dark brown warps and have a selvage of 2.5 centimeters. Like other textiles from the same area, these samples uh, have occasionally uh, wet clothing on the back. The same duck appear also mirrored in a med medallion on one of the other fragments in the upper stiftung that I used to reconstruct the thunder fragment in on jaw here. In this case, the duck, which is mirrored and framed by a smaller medallion with a flower at every cardinal point, appears as the secondary motif that accompany a large lob rundle framing a pair of mirrors standing lions and two mirrors running wild donkeys underneath them. Each lob of uh, this rundle encloses a different animal. Both these elements and the overall structure record the piece in Anjo and suggest a unique style which seems typical of this textile, likely produced in southwestern area of China. If we look carefully at the panel fragment, in the first rundle on the right, we can see half body of an animal decorated with vertical weave motifs that record the body of the tiger that are repeated in a red fragment also in the upper stiftum. Here. The central rundle instead has two animals. A running wild donkey at the bottom, facing left, and what look like um, an Himalayan blue sheep above it, facing right. The left rundle feature what I believe look like a saigon tilobe with a necklace, and I will talk more about this identification later. Regarding the top left mid-sized rundle, only the hooks of an animal facing left, followed by a stretch curly mane lion facing the opposite direction and a wing pedestal at the bottom were visible. This element suggested that they were part of a rundle that framed a mirror image, likely another animal. By considering several textile fragments generally identified the Sogdian or Sasanian, meaning Central Asian or Iranian, featuring stags, deer, and antilopes with identical feet, I decided to reconstruct the missing animals as stag. I had initially designed um, 15 identical rundles. However, by taking into account that the rundles were uneven and by looking at other fragments with a similar composition, I ended my reconstruction with a total of 18 rundles. Regarding the motif in the large central medallion, which was still undetermined, I considered two designs, one from another fragment in the upper stiftung, featuring a couple of mirror hidden curly mane lions with the raised front paw and running donkey underneath them, and another with a stag or possibly a hell, featuring unique antlers made with smaller uh, crescents, wearing a necklace with three medallions in the China National Silk Museum. Both were considered royal animals among Central Asian people. Given that the overall reconstruction was based on the technical analysis undertaken on the fragment with the two ducks, which had a possible width of 92 or 121.5 centimeters, depending on the original pattern, which might have had three or four more rundles. I believe that the thick fragment in Anjo was part of a large uh, panel composed, was a large panel composed of four pieces measuring about 80 centimeters each. To date, the loom used for weaving this compound, which likely lacked a tool that equally separated the works, had not yet been discovered, has not yet been discovered. As Fen Zhao, director of the China National Silk Museum, has suggested, he might have been similar to the vertical Zilu loom, which is still used today in Iran. This loom could reach a width of 10 meters and a height of 4 meters. Using a vertical loom, the weaver could also produce the floating weft on the reverse of the compound, like um, those that appear on um, the fragment or many of the fragments from uh, Dulan. However, the type of loom used for weaving these silks uh, had to include a system of cord crossing the warps and lashes, each connected to a set of warps according to the design that had to be produced. Pattern repeats appear in the weft direction, but not repeats 
in, um, but not repeated in the warp direction. Since this loom, which was not a mechanical engine uh, as those used today, lacked a patterning program, the weaver could only proceed with what Fen Zhao called the pickup method, which in, uh, in case of the texture from Dulan occurred on a sample with uh, lashes. The weaver would have started the pattern from the outline toward the inline and then completed the rest of the gram in a straight sequence, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, uh, or more, according to the weft colors. In 2017, I discovered that the fragment in Anjou was the continuation of a panel held uh, in the Avish Stiftung that also includes a fragment and play fabric at the top and polychromatic trim at the bottom. Unlike my reconstruction, which included the complete pattern as I had imagined it, the original instead showed only the giant central medallion framed by 20 small beaded rundle in, instead of 18, like in my reconstruction, and pedals, and a little more um, than a quarter of a medium sized rundle at each corner, enclosing a bowl instead of a stag. Surprisingly, the central animal were two mirrored elves um, or with antler made of small crescents, standing or rare feet in front of a Sassanian style tree of life, but like the type that we see in uh, Takebustan in Iran. The animal was uh, one of the two types I had selected as a central mirror motif for my reconstruction though. The tree, like a central axis, divides the composition into two mirror parts and suggests that the loom's width comprises only one pattern. The compositions recall very much a blue and white double faced fragment in the National Sikh Museum of Iran in Tehran. However, although it is said to be of the early Islamic period, I believe it is from the 10th or 11th century. It features a double medallion enclosing two seated mirror griffin in front of central palm tree. There are 16 double beaded rundles between the two medallions, each framing an animal, except for the two rundles at the top and bottom on the central axis that enclose um, a star flower. Interestingly, secondary motifs are smaller medallion enclosing a uh, flower with a small blossom at each cardinal point, similar to those graphic elements on some of the fragments in the upper stiftung enclosing that that I mentioned uh, before. Independently from the date of this fragment in Tehran, it is, seems clear that such compositions with, uh, with the central rounders made of small rounders enclosing animals and secondary medallion with this extra motif at cardinal points were known between Iran and Tibet. By reconstructing the whole pattern, I had imagined a larger panel made of four pieces of 80 centimeter each with a perfect medallion at the center. The panel in the Adish Dictum instead is woven as a single piece of 181 by 175 centimeter instead of 160 centimeter, like the total width of the two central panel according to my reconstruction with the difference of only uh, 15 centimeters which make the central roundel uh, in, on the panel in the Abek looks like a novel, uh, a novel framed by uh, 20 small roundels of different dimension. In this regard, only loom similar to the Zidu loom not equipped with the divisional warp tool, such as the one mentioned before, could have produced a panel of this dimension. Sixth century documents from Dunhuang and Dufa refer to some polychromatic textiles that have been, which were made in warp phase and web phase structure, which generally were 190 to 116 centimeter long and 95, 107 centimeter wide. However, a few documents also mention a type of textile called dajin, meaning large jean, which differ from the John Jean, the medium Jean, they measure 230 by 110 centimeters. We can assume that the Da Jean was larger than the Don Jean, and possibly it was referring to a large silk panel similar to the one I am discussing today. The small number of Chinese web faced jeans incorporating Central Asian motif, but with best twisted work, 
and mainly be discovered into fun and uh, a few also into land. However, the panel discussed in this paper is Z-twisted works, which are generally seen in Central Asian weaving. The spinning direction of the, uh, the spinning direction of the work, in fact, is recognized as Chinese if it's twisted clockwise and S, and Central Asia if it's twisted, uh, twisted counterclockwise and Z. But it was, uh, this was not a, a rule. Regarding the iconographic analysis, the material evidence made it clear that the panel was part of a unique textile production that differed from those developed earlier in Central Asia. Although some of the motifs appear very similar to those on the fragment from the Tufan Duhang area, the overall combination of the graphic elements, the color palette, as well as the thickness of the fabric suggests a further step in the development of the Iranian iconography on web based compounds that had begun century, uh, centuries earlier in Central Asia, and that in China was acquired through the arrival of foreign monks, merchants, and artisans, and the establishment of Iranian and Central Asian colonies. With the rise um, of the Tibetans in Western China in the 7th century, Central Asian textile iconography developed into a new form, which eventually became part of the semi-nomadic people lifestyle that formed the Tibetan Empire. In Qinghai in 663, the Tibetans had absorbed the local to Yuhun of Proto-Mongolian origin that had migrated in the area around the fourth century. But even under the Tibetan ruler, the two Yuhun continued to use their social, political, and cultural systems and present and tributes to the Tibetans, supplying them with material and pay taxes. They were in contact with the Ephthalites, another group of people of unknown origin who at the time dominated Central Asia and acted as their translator in China. Historical record demonstrated, in fact, a certain level of Chinese acculturation and use of the Chinese writing system. Therefore, it is likely that the two Yuhun directly imported textile material from both uh, Central Asia and China. As it is seen in the famous painting, Emperor Taizong giving audience to the ambassador of Tibet by Yang Ben, the Tibetans were already accustomed to Central Asian textile at the rise of their empire. The scroll illustrates the Tibetan ambassador, or perhaps a Tu, or a tu Yuhun, wearing a robe made of two types of textile. A red ground featuring ducks in rondos, like the type previously discussed and that I would discuss further later, and the arches enclosing various animals and a beige yellow ground. A cloth made of this latter type, radiocarbon dated to the 7th century, now in the upper stiftung, was displayed in Dufang in 2019. It features carlemen lions, ibexes, foods, and elves. However, a Tibetan ink inscription has been found in the hem, which implies that it was written before the transformation of the fabric, perhaps originally uh, hanging, into an outfit. The custom of inscribing textile with ink was not unusual. Some fragments in Switzerland, previously mentioned, also disclose Tibetan inscription. Going back to the duck. This animal was one of the most popular motifs that widely appeared on various media across Eurasia. It is often attributed to the Sasanians and is seen on the costume as it's seen on the costume of some people carved in the rock um, relief of Pakistan in Iran and on the robe of one of the so called Sasanian ambassadors in Afrasab, Sogdiana, both dated to the 7th century. A coeval similar example of unknown provenance, but attributed to Iran, that which will prove the origin of the motif, is a silk web face wheel fragment in the Cleveland Museum of Art. The piece, which records those from Qinghai, shows two lob rondels enclosing dark, uh, ducks facing left. Above these two, there is a horizontal band with a sequence of overlap leaves, a motif that is identical to an 8th century band with the pallet inscription mentioning um, the Iranian title, the great king of king, woven on the back, um, which also was discovered in, uh, uh, that also was discovered in uh, uh, Dulang. The same leaf motif also appeared 
um, uh, appears on the border of the Randall at the corner of the panel in Anjou. In the 8th century, single mirror ducks in close embedded of, of the Randalls were still considered auspicious and royal motif. Lob Randalls and closing ducks also appear depicted on the peel of, of the Buddha in Paris Nirvana uh, in Mogao Cave 158, dated to the mid Tang period when Dongfang fell to the Tibetans. The Tibetan emperor, leading the ruler of the Buddhist world and mourning for the terrestrial death of the Buddha, was initially illustrated in the cave. That part of the cave collapsed or was vandalized in the 70s during the uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution, but at the beginning of the last century was still there, as we can see in a black and white photo taken by the French Orientalist Paul Pelion. While some of the animals depicted on the panel under discussion are already found on earlier stones, such as ducks with the ribbon, carlimine lions, boots, and crescent antler uh, elks, others, such as tigers, ibexes, entire boars, running donkeys, and elephants, seem to be unique to these groups of textiles. Once again, by looking at other fragments, it seems likely that they were preferred in the making of what has been recognized as a Southwestern textile production. Metal works from Qinghai also exemplify the broad use of this animal uh, representation. But although they can be traced back to early Iranian models, they are more naturalistic and combined with other floral motifs typical of the Tang. The inclusion of animals into be the rumbles or logs composing larger medallions and accompanied by other flower elements was a further step in the iconographic advancement of the web based compound. Regarding the other animals on the panel, the boar appeared uniquely depicted with the whole body. Randall with boar heads, uh, also embroidered, have been widely discovered in the Tufan and Qinghai Tibetan areas. Deer and stags, which in Iranian art are connected to royal hunt, were clearly preferred uh, among nomadic or semi-nomadic people as a seen um, and seen as a royal symbol. But the combination of stag and birds especially appears in Tibetan material cultures, as it's seen on a few pieces uh, of garment from the same period and might have been associated with hunting magic. Um, as um, an expression of a single force of power. In Tibetan culture, both stags and birds of various species are primarily guardian of the soul and bring good fortune. The animal with lace, uh, instead, is an unusual image that I have identified as a female Saigantilope. Um, but the abbot instead has described it as a dromedary, a species of African camel that differ from the Bactrian camel with two hands found across um, Central Asia. It might be uh, a Bactrian dromedary um, hybrid dog. Neither lion uh, nor elephant are native of Tibet, but they appear in 8th, 9th century Tibetan art due to the exchanges with the neighboring countries. Um, in one of the earliest pillars found in central Tibet dated to the 8th century, these two animals in fact appear together. Their combination might be due to the spreading of Buddhism. The lion was the symbol of Shakyamuni's clan, the Shakya, and the elephant was the ultimate incarnation of the Buddha before he was born to Queen Maya. Uh, furthermore, seated Carlimin lion statues have been discovered in the Dulan tomb and uh, Tibet, but the elephant that appear in the two bidder rounds at the bottom of the large central medallion on the panel are rarely found in textiles, but they appear on Nepalese coins. As depicted on the panel, their body features recall those and a few rare Byzantine and Central Asian textile fragments dating between the, the 9th and the 10th centuries. Renowned examples are a piece um, are a, um, uh, a piece from the Asian Cathedral Treasury, Germany, showing Randall enclosing an elephant with a tree on its back, but also a piece under uh, used as the Shroud of Saint Joss in uh, Cannes, uh, Normandy, 
uh, depicting elephant, composite beast, camels, earths, and an Arabic inscription. There was, um, and it's possible that this textile was um, woven in Khorasan, Central Asia. This image can be traced back to the sixth century mosaic floor uh, of the Mount Synagogue at Mirim in Jerusalem. The remaining mosaics showed, uh, um, showed a mirror composite composition of randals, enclosing birds, fruits, and other animals. Among these, there are also two elephants um, under uh, two palm trees, and above, at the center, a large menorah adjoined by two lions. Without going back in time, a more relevant inclusive comparison can be traced with the coeval image of a ruler portrayed by Dr. Noshirvan in Gar, uh, Afghanistan, dated to the 8th century. The figure, seated on a throne with two horses, wears a crown made with wings and uh, ram horns. The halo behind him is surrounded by various animals, among which are also two elephants at the bottom. This figure has been interpreted as the Iranian god Bahman, or the supreme being Ahura Mazda, or also seen as the protector of men and animals. But he might be the more straightforward representation of a Turkey ruler portrayed like an Iranian god. The picture offers a good way to interpret the motif on the textile panel indeed. According to the nomadic Turkic tradition, the ruler tent was identified as the ruler himself. In this regard, on textiles, the central mirror royal animal, or elf, uh, might have been a representation of the ruler of the Tibetans, who dominated the scenes, which was a representation of the universe. According to Peter Andrews, in fact, and I quote, both nomadic and princely tradition shared an imagery in which the tent was seen as a replica of the sky, and the occupant was exalted by association with it, end of quote. A similar analogy can be drawn between the arcade system with niches enclosing divinities behind the ruler at Nigar, um, also seen in Soviet art, and the beaded arches with animals on the beige yellow clock in the abbey. While the circles in the bodies of the animals by the 8th or 9th centuries had become standard features, the triangle that appeared in the standing stag in front of the central tree and the, element, uh, the elephant on the panel is unique. As I have discussed in my previous work, uh, the circular motif can be traced back to the internal organs in the bodies of the stags, features on the wall carpet discovered in Pazirik in the Altai, possibly made in Central Asia and dated to the 5th century BCE. They were eventually adapted and seen as representation of the sun and moon. All these elements were likely employed to express royalty, power, and glory. However, the triangles recall some of those bronze amulets collected by Giuseppe Tucci in Tibet. Its symbology is common to many traditions and carries a cosmogonic meaning that in Tibetan, Tibetan mystical literature is called the original truth. Triangular variation associated with animals appear in, Dungfan caves, um, in the Dungfan caves around the 6th century as well. Therefore, it looks like the triangles, two circles, and multiple bits in the animal body all represented the universe according to the manic visualization of life and the afterlife. The trim at the bottom of the panel and the fragment and clay fabric at the top suggest that it was intended to be hung. According to the analysis undertaken by the Abish Tifton, gilded silver plaques featuring various birds or mythological flying creatures were attached to some of these textiles, including the clock mentioned before. Large uh, panels would have been combined by later narrow panels and as organized together might have composed the interior of a large tent used for banqueting and great assemblies similar to those still in use today in Central Asia. 
Chinese sources mention a golden pen that both the Tibetan and the Uyghur used in the 8th, 9th century that was decorated with golden animal cast in the round. Such dwellings were also referred to as hundred men tent, a term used to describe Xionyu tents in the past uh, in the past and continued to be used for Mongol tents later. This description suggested the dimension of the space and implied the use of large interior panel. But the custom of decorating the interior with silk panels and gold was already in use among the Turks in the sixth century. The Byzantine historian Menander Protector describes three tents of the Western Turkic, uh, Turkic leader, the Zabulus, where a Byzantine envoy was received. The first, which was constructed on two wheels, had the interior decorated with simple silk draperies of different colors. The second, also decorated with silk draperies uh, featuring various figures, gathered gold objects such as fern, basin, and jars at the center. And the third one, which was supported by columns with gilded timber, included a golden seat supported by four gold peacocks. Considering that Tibetan tombs, such as those in Tibet and Qinghai, are shaped as large trapezoid, square or semicircular mound, recalling nomadic tents, a funerary use of this panel should not be excluded. The principal tomb excavated in Dulan has revealed an upper mound, which has been identified as a sanctuary, and a lower mound as, um, as the actual tomb containing remains of horses, sheep, and yards as well. These tense shapes can also be seen on wooden coffins excavated in Qinghai. Among the Turks and other nomadic uh, groups, tent color distinguished aristocrats from ordinary people who were referred to as white and black bonds, respectively. But the complexity of the scenes, the luxurious clothing worn by some of the characters depicted, and the variety of animals similar to those on the textile panels and people, including foreigners, on the coffins records early Sino-Soldian funerary panels discovered in central China. Although it is not easy to define the degree to which the Soldian, Chinese, or Turks influence the funerary narrative representation from the textile and gilded metal work, we can definitely see how this material, which is often identified as Central Asia, was highly appreciated among early Tibetans. Like the Turks, the Tibetans also combined different religions and funerary traditions that eventually shared similar aspects, such as self-lacerations, which was a practice uh, that is depicted in the Zoroastrian ritual on one of the marble panels of uh, the funerary couch now in the Mio Museum in Japan, dated to uh, the 6th or 7th century. And in the morning scenes depicted in Dufuang Cave 158, previously mentioned. Such practice is also reported in the Dou Shu or Book of Zhou. According to this source, when someone died, the body of the deceased was laid in the tent while children, grandchildren, and relatives sacrificed sheep and horses in front of it. Then they rode their horses around the tent seven times and slashed their faces each time they came to. Um, the opposite side of the tent entrance. After this first ritual, they chose that they and burned all the deceased belongings, including the tent. Then they dug a grave and buried the ashes. However, in the seventh century, after the fall of the first Turki Kaganate, the funerary custom of cremation was changed to burial. The Qinghai coffins in this regard visually exemplify um, visually exemplify this change in the multiple nomadic tradition that had been acquired and locally adapted by the Tubo or early Tibetans. Likewise, the sumptuous textile panel discussed today highlights the use of animals in a mobile society and their sacrifice to ensure a good transition to the afterlife. Although the origin of this textile material, which likely belonged to high-ranking people, is still unknown, Sichuan seems to be the most plausible area where it was woven, as suggested by technical analysis, the technical analysis presented. Textile production were established in the area since antiquity, 
The recent excavation has shown the use of pattern in looms for weaving work based compound dated to the Han period. This compound, attributed to the Chinese, has the pattern repeat, uh, repeated on in the warp direction. It was created with a complementary warp of two or more series in one weft. But by the 8th century, wet phase compound had become the most popular structure and replaced the previous one. Because Qinghai was a key region between northern, central, and southern area that had acquired importance also thanks to the two Yuhun activities, it is possible that over the centuries it had developed a unique trade of textiles and metalworks. It is well documented that trade between China and Central Asia occurred along the northern and southern Silk Road around the Taklamakan Desert and at the edges of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. Nonetheless, an exterior route from Kokonor to Lhasa might have been used in the Tang period. Although they look Central Asia, this new composition might have been made explicitly for the Tibetan Empire, which at the time also included parts of Sichuan and Qinghai. The weaving process, the preference for burgundy red textile ground, and the presence of running wild donkeys are unique features of this compound. The material recently excavated in Qinghai or that appear on the art market, likely from the same area, requires further analysis to understand the complexity of early Tibetan society along the external branch of the primary silk road between Gansu and Sichuan and across the Himalayas. Some of the graphic elements that compose the overall composition of the panel are unique and not found on other Central Asian textiles. Although it reveals the cultural and artistic exchanges between Turkey reigning Proto-Mongolian Chinese and Tibetan societies that had begun a century earlier, some of the animals as also depicted on the coffin from Qinghai were indigenous species which might have extinguished. Between the 8th and 9th centuries, at the peak of the Tibetan expansion, the web based textile technique had evolved and was used to create a larger and thicker hanging. They were customized to accommodate the Tibetan tank construction, which was likely adopted from Turkey reigning model. Although a Qinghai weaving production cannot be proved, it is not unfair to say that these textiles were created for the Qinghai inhabitants perhaps in Sichuan, or important directly across the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau from non-traditional Central Asian workshops, meaning uh, those established between Sogdiana and um, Gansu, perhaps in today Afghanistan or Pakistan. This area can be identified as uh, Turan or the land of two Turanians, also identified as Turks in the early Islamic period which was the opposite spatial unit of Iran, or the Iran Shah, that during the Sassanian period was the land between the Oxus River or Murdaria to the east and the Euphrates rivers to the west. The provenance of the panel is unknown, but likely it came from a bare mound shaped tomb, which recreated the golden tent described in historical record and played an integral role in the continuing the nomadic tradition in the afterlife. Thank you very much for your attention.